All right, I have 302. So I think we can go ahead and get this webinar started. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, we are here to talk to you about researching your community with QGIS. So I will introduce myself. My name is Kate McNally Carter and Open Educational Resources Librarian at University of Houston. And hello, everybody. My name is Joshua Bin, and I work with Data and Digital Scholarship, which includes GIS at Baylor University. All right. So before we get started, we just wanted to have a quick reminder to go ahead and download QGIS. Um, if you have not already, I was able to email, I think most of you, if you um, registered uh, before Monday, um, I was able to, to send you some reminders about this, but um, we'll do some brief introduction material. So you should have time to install QGIS if you have not already, since this is a oh, I think I got muted by accident. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah, please feel free to uh, download QGIS now if you haven't already. All right, so before we get started, I wanted to talk briefly about what is our goal here? Um, what, are, what are we doing? What do we mean by researching our community? Um, so it's a little bit like using data to snoop on your neighbors, but maybe not in as creepy of a way as Ray Peterson did with his neighbors in the burbs. Um, so instead, what we're going to be doing is using open data to type in a, an address in anywhere in Texas, and within a 5, 10, and 15 mile radius, you'll be able to calculate summary statistics about those buffers in that around that location. So that is basically what we are going to be talking to you about today. Um, that is the end goal of this webinar. So just to provide a brief overview of what we're gonna be covering, the first part, we're gonna be talking, talking about how to load and join data. Um, so we'll provide the data um, for that as well. Um, and then the second part, we're going to be um, focusing on locating addresses, adding those buffers and using spatial joins to find those summary statistics. Um, we'll have quizzes for those of you who do want to follow along with us. Um, we are making this a hands-on webinar, so hopefully the pace should be relatively easy for you to keep up with. Um, but if you'd like, you can also just observe, um, and you can treat those quiz times as just short breaks. Um, so please ask questions as needed. You can use the chat. You can also unmute yourself. Um, if you're not comfortable being recorded, please go ahead and use the chat as well. Um, this webinar is being recorded and we'll be sharing out, uh, we'll be posting the, re the recording on the TDL YouTube. Okay, all right. So uh, first we very briefly wanna just go over, you know, what is QGIS? So QGIS is a free and open source desktop GIS software, and that is used to create maps and geospatial um, analysis. It's extensible with plugins so that you can conduct more sophisticated spatial analytical functions. And we'll be using a plugin a little bit later in the webinar. So one of the nice things about it is that it's um, available for Windows and Mac. So it's a great alternative to ArcGIS if you're a Mac user. Um, because it's easy to download um, for, for both. And also apparently also, uh, for mobile devices. So I have not tried it with a mobile device. Um, it's open source, so there's no formal trouble, troubleshooting, uh, but the GIS Stack Exchange is a really great place to get help. Um, and you can also reach out to the TDL GIS interest group. And we have a lot of people who are more than happy to help with any kind of troubleshooting or any questions you might have about it. So some basic QGIS tools or um, dialog boxes that you'll be using a lot and we'll be focusing on today are the data source manager. Um, so this was what allows you to add da data and layers to your project. The processing toolbox is where you'll find all of the main functions that you can use to run analysis on your data. And the plugins menu is where you're going to be installing and managing your plugins. So plugins will enable you to extend the functionality of QGIS. And because it's open source, there are a lot of plugins available for you to do a lot of different types of functions. Um, there's over a thousand different plugins, so lots of different options. So really briefly, we'll talk a little bit about the formats that we're gonna be focusing on today. 
Um, if you have a basic understanding of GIS software, you'll be familiar with vector data and raster data. So very simply, vector data is points, lines, and polygons. So lines will connect points with lines, and polygons will connect points within a closed shape. Raster data is continuous data displayed as a grid. So raster data is good to display things that have continuous um, data, such as a temperature and elevation, whereas vector data is going to have um, more defined boundary lines. Shape files are a type of geospatial vector data format for GIS software. And so these are going to store the location, the geometry, and attribution of point, line, and polygon features. So for this webinar, we have provided shape files from the US Census. We'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment. Um, we also have tabular data. And so this tabular data provides information about the various characteristics of the area that we're interested in. So we'll chat about the data sources that we're going to be using in just a moment. So very simply, the workflow for how this project comes together, uh, we collect the data. So this was pre-done for this webinar. We'll talk a little bit about how that was done. Um, then we also will basically load the data and then merge that geospatial data with the tabular data. Then we're gonna geocode the location and add the buffers around that location. And then we'll use spatial joins to calculate the summary statistics within the buffers. So that's gonna be kind of the, the overview of kind of what we're gonna be doing um, kind of in a nutshell. So briefly, we'll talk a little bit about the data sources that we use to collect the data for this webinar. So IPUMS NHGIS is um, the source where we collected the American Community Survey data for 2017 to 2021, uh, which is available through the US Census. Um, so basically this includes a variety of characteristics like uh, social data, um, so education, veteran status, disability status. Um, it also has uh, data related to economic, housing and demographic information. Um, so you, to download from NHGIS, you do need to have an account, but it is free. Um, and this data is also available through the US Census. Um, so for the ACS demographic and social data, um, and also, yes, so, so this is a source for, for both of these items. So I wanted to mention that the census block group shapefile is based on the 2021 tire line of da um, data from the US Census Bureau. Uh, they don't contain any, um, the, so the tiger line um, information doesn't contain the demographic information, but it does contain the geographic entity codes or the geo IDs that you can use to link to the census data. So this will make more sense, hopefully, when we get to that point in the webinar. Um, but, and we'll talk a little bit about how we prepare the data in just a second. So another source of the data that we collected for this webinar is the Texas Capital Data Portal. Um, so this is where we drew pre presidential election data from 2020. Um, so for this webinar, again, the, the election data was summarized from voter tabulation districts to the census block districts. And our third source of data was from World Climb. So this was where we pulled information about the average temperature. Um, World Climb hosts high resolution global weather and climate data for mapping and spatial modeling. And the raster data from World Climb was summarized within each census block group. And then finally, um, we also have some bonus data that we won't probably cover today um, during this webinar, but if you'd like to, to play with it, it's available for you. So uh, the Texas Education Agency open data site has um, feature classes and CSV files for counties, districts, and schools, um, current and archival um, that you can drill down to the census block group. Um, the source of the school year or the school campus data for the year 2022 to 2023 was captured and um, downloaded and reorganized for this webinar. And it'll, it will be included with the data that you will have downloaded or that you will download here shortly. So I'm going to turn it over to Josh briefly to talk about the 
uh, pre data preparation. All right. Uh, hello again, everyone. Um, so just like in the cooking shows that we all love to watch, things are done behind the scenes so that we can show uh, how to make the apple pie in just five minutes. Uh, our intention for this webinar is to highlight QGIS and how it can be used along with the publicly accessible data that uh, Kate was just showing us in order to research your community or any community. We want to ensure that all of the data is going to work smoothly and swimmingly by the census block group. And if you can switch. All right. So we made a couple of uh, adjustments to the data so that it could work uh, smoothly for this webinar. The first thing we did is that the census track shapefile, sorry, the block group shapefile that we downloaded from IPUMS and HGIS was unprojected the image on the left, uh, meaning that the measurements and locations were still in degrees, decimal degrees, as opposed to a linear measurement. Measuring and locating a piece of the Earth's spherical surface in degrees is great, uh, but it's less than ideal for 2D mapping on our screens like we're going to be doing today. Part of the reason for that is that one degree of longitude um, is uh, quite wide at the equator, but it gets smaller and smaller as you go north and south. So that means that one degree of longitude is different uh, measurement depending where on the earth you are. Um, uh, so that uh, this makes it difficult for QGIS, uh, which what we want to do for the exercise today, it makes it difficult for QGIS to measure those five, 10 and 15 mile radii from whatever address or location you specify. Uh, so, uh, so that we don't have to reproject the file during the webinar, we already projected it using the Texas statewide mapping system, which uses meters as its units. And a meter is a constant everywhere. Uh, also, can you see the effect of projecting the map? Uh, the one on the left is a little bit more stretched out. It's just taking what was on the uh, sphere and just flattening it on a page, but when it's projected and you can actually now see the curvature of the earth, you can see the big difference between the left and the right image. All right. Thanks, Kate. Uh, also, the voter data uh, that was provided by the Capital Data Portal is organized by Voter Tabulation District. Again, for convenience of working with only block groups today, we use the spatial join technique, similar to what we'll be using later, to summarize the voter data from the voter tabulation districts into the block groups. And what you're seeing zoomed in here is downtown Waco and the voter tabulation districts on the left and the census block groups on the right. And the next one. And the world climb data, uh, temperature is provided in a raster grid like uh, Kate was describing. And what we did was we converted the raster to features or vector data, and then summarized the data again by block group. So that's what is in the Excel file. And finally, the last one, is the census data that we downloaded from the IPUMS NHGIS did not calculate percents for us. So we very easily and quickly, like in this example here, just calculated the percents ourselves. And with that, I'm going to return the mic to Kate. All right. Thank you, Josh. So I'm going to drop a link in chat for uh, the data. So we'll be walking through the first part where we're going to be loading the shapefile and ACS data into our QJS project and then joining the data and playing with the symbology. So if you did not already download the, the data from um, my email uh, on, I guess, yeah, Tuesday, yesterday, um, then you can go ahead and go to that link. And then I will briefly jump out of this. Um, so I wanted to point out that when you download the data, you'll also get um, this really nifty um, Word document that has all of the steps that um, we are going to walk through today. So just in case you do need to step out early, or if you'd like to have something to refer back to besides the recording, then this is going to be available to you. So the link to, that I dropped in chat should link you to this a page where you'll be able to see the QGIS webinar folder. So all you need to do is right click and select download 
and it's going to zip all of the data files together into a zipped folder. And it's going to take a very long time because it's it's um, thinking that I'm doing a lot of things right now. There it goes. So all you have to do from there is go into your downloads folder and then simply extract all of your folder, all of the files. So you can extract it into a folder where you'll be able to find it easily. Um, for me, I, I, um, I saved it previously on my desktop, which is easy to access quickly. Um, so, uh, but you can put it wherever you, you'll be able to find it quickly. Um, and if you open it up, you'll be able to see, um, again, we have that the Word document. Um, and then also uh, the, the webinar data, that is the tabular data is in this Excel file and then all of the files that comprise the shape files. Okay, so um, any questions before we get started, before we jump into the QJS walkthrough? I know it's a lot of information, but this is where we get into the fun, the fun part. Okay. So you can, as you're ready, go ahead and open up. You can launch QGIS. Um, so I already have it launched here. And you'll, when you first open it, you'll see a whole page. Um, you can open a new project by clicking this blank little white paper icon in the top left corner. And then you'll be able to see this white screen. So um, you'll see a lot of, um, different items, icons on the toolbar ribbon um, here. Um, you'll, depending on your use of QGIS, the plugins that you've installed, um, if you've opened up the processing toolbox, uh, some of these items may not necessarily be on your screen whenever you're opening QGIS, especially if it's the first time you've used it. But no worries, we will walk you through all of that today. So the first thing we're going to want to do is load our data. So there's a couple ways you can do this. Uh, you can do this really easily from the browser tab um, using just the, um, basically the, the quick navigation to, to find the data on your desktop or wherever it was that you, you added it. Another way that you can do that is through the open data, this, this icon that says open data source manager. So I mentioned previously that the data source manager is a way that you can add data to your project. Um, so the browser tab is the same as what is already on the screen. Um, so here you can just navigate to your desktop and have a lot of layers. <laughs> so it, wherever you saved your QGIS webinar data, you can open that up and QGIS sometimes takes a, a moment to figure that out. And let's go ahead and add just the shape file um, just to get started. So you can double click or you can also click this little tiny button that says add, I think add selected layers. Um, so you can also just double click and that will populate this onto your project um, as a layer and it will use any color that just defaults to QGIS, there's, um, it, it will come in as whatever color that it wants to. <laughs> so for me, apparently the QGIS is in Barbie mode today. So the next thing we wanna do is we want to load the Excel spreadsheet or the Excel file. So if you expand that particular icon, that, that list item, QJS does tend to take a, a moment to figure this out. And then sometimes it just does crazy things where it closes. So let's try it from this screen. Oops, goodness. <laughs> I feel like this is the, the one part where QJS does get a little bit glitchy on my, on my end. Go ahead, there we go. All right, now let's open this. When you expand this, you should be able to see all of the different sheets that are in that Excel spreadsheet. 
So, okay, now it's opened. So now, and this might be helpful to actually show you the data itself. Do, do, do. So the Excel spreadsheet um, has several different tabs where they're, all of the data is located. The sources tab will just go through where the data was collected. Um, ACS is going to be the American Community Survey data. Presidential election data is going to be in this tab, and then average temperature and school data. So as you can see in QGIS, it's pulling all of these different sheets as separate layers that you can add. So here we can go ahead and add these one at a time. We don't need all of them, um, but for, to get started, we'll add the ACS data, and it adds down here into my layers panel. The average temperature, so I'm just double clicking, and then the presidential election data. Okay. So you might have noticed that the layers here from adding this data didn't visibly change our project in any way. Um, that's because the, these data are not connected to the shapefile data. So that is something that we're going to do next is we're going to join that data. So if you right click on, and this is just to demonstrate, you don't have to do this on your own. If you right click and open the, the attribute table, you'll be able to see all of the different fields that were listed in that Excel spreadsheet. Um, and you'll notice uh, that the GeoID is a common field or variable that links all of these together. So if I were to do the same thing, open the attribute table for ACS, there it goes. So in the ACS attributes, you'll see the GeoID is there as well. So the GeoID is the variable that we're going to use to join our data. So both of these, um, both of these, um, all three of the different layers that we added, we're going to join with the shapefile so that they'll all be represented in the, the shapefile data. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and close those. So if you opened your attribute tables, you can go ahead and close those as well. So next we need to go ahead and join our data. So we can right click on the Texas Block Groups shapefile. And from here, we wanna click on properties. So you'll see, um, depending on where you, where you were previously, if you had QGIS open, you might open in a different place. Um, mine opened in Symbology. We'll play with that in just a minute. Um, for now, the first thing we need to do is to join the data so that it understands um, that all of these things are connected. So we'll click the Joins uh, tab on the left side of this Layer Properties window. So the, in order to join our data, we do need to click on this Add Join. You'll see a blank screen because we don't have any joins right now, but we can add them by clicking this little green plus sign. So because I'm in the shape file, um, it's going to ask me of the other layers, which, which layer do you want to join? So we'll start with ACS 2017 to 2021. And I mentioned earlier that the geo ID was the common variable between all of these different data sets. So we're gonna join the field geo ID to the target field geo ID. And then you don't need to do anything else with this, except uh, we do recommend that you do provide a custom field name prefix. Um, the reason for this, um, and now I'll show you briefly because I think it makes more sense when you see why you wanna do this. Um, if you join the data with this prefix, then it makes the fields very difficult to see. So I'm just gonna go ahead and really briefly show you, you don't need to do this on your end. But I just added that join without adding the actual, or without changing the prefix. 
And so now my data is joined to the, the shapefile. The ACS data is joined to the shapefile. And I can see now there's all these new columns over here. Um, but unfortunately, I have this prefix here that's really obscuring the name of these different fields. And so that's the reason why we recommend going ahead and giving your, your data a custom field prefix, um, because otherwise it's really hard to see what's going on. So I'm going to go back into my joins. So if you um, went ahead and, and clicked close on those, um, that's OK. You can just click on the join layer and then edit with the little pencil icon. And then you can go back and edit the, the join settings. So here I'm going to go ahead and give it a custom name, field name prefix, by just deleting them. And then click OK. And then apply. OK, and so we have two more tables or tabular data to, to join with our shapefile. So we can go ahead and do that now. So you do, do it the same way. So you just click the plus sign. And now it's showing me just the two that I have left. It's not showing the one that I just joined because it's already joined. So same process, average temperature. I want to join the field GeoID to the target field GeoID. And similarly, I will give this a custom name prefix by just deleting that prefix. Click OK. And then I'll do it one more time with our presidential election data. We're going to join the GeoID to the GeoID. Custom name prefix. And we're just going to delete that. And click OK. Now it's showing all three joins in my joins menu. So I'll click apply and then click OK. So now, again, it didn't change anything um, appearance wise. The project still looks the same. But if I were to go in, back into my Texas Block Group's attributes, opening the attribute table, now I'll be able to see all of those different data points combined into one single uh, data set. So all of these are now connected to the shapefile. So the name, the population property value, percent owner occupied, the percentage of bachelor degrees, all of those are now connected to the shapefile. Also Celsius and Fahrenheit for the average temperature, and then the Biden-Trump um, percentage votes for each of those census block groups. Now they're all joined to the shapefile. And now that's that's what enables us to change the symbology and do the different things with this data. So, but before I do that, I do want to stop here to see if there are any questions. Anybody had any trouble with any of those steps? All right, thumbs up. Awesome, great. I think this is a great place to also, if you're like me and you start things without saving them, you can go ahead and save your project. <laughs> I've done this many times where I have just lost things, just poof, they're gone. So I'm going to go ahead and, and name my project. You can name your project, whatever you like. I'm gonna name mine Houston Community data because I'm based in Houston and I will probably be looking at the Houston area for most of my things. All right, so next we, what we can do is play with the symbology. So the symbology will enable us to basically an, analyze the different characteristics of all of these census block groups. So to do that, we're going to right click again on our Texas block groups shapefile. Go back to properties. So this is a another menu you'll get very familiar with as you're working in QGIS. So you'll click on the symbology tab to change the symbology. And if you're like me, I always get really distracted by all of this really cool pretty stuff in the middle of the, the menu. 
Um, but what you want to start off with is really way up here in this little tiny drop down. Um, right now it's under a sing single symbol. So it's using sing a single symbol for all of the different uh, characteristics. So what we want to do is change this to graduated. So basically what this will do is change it from one single color to a range of colors based on a certain value. So we change that to graduated. And so now our dialog box looks different. Um, we have different options. So next we want to select the value that we want our gradation, our, our different uh, class of classes based on. So here is where you click on the drop down, and you'll want to go ahead and select one of these values. Um, so I'll go ahead and start with the income value, and we'll we'll look at all this in just a moment. But the first thing to do here is to go ahead and click on the classify option, and this is going to basically calculate the categories where the graduation breaks, so where you're going to have those different breaks. So if I click on classify, it's going to show me all of these different symbols that are associated with the following values. And the mode is the, the default mode that it does this is basically through this equal count quantile setting, um, which basically means that it's going to try to find equal numbers of features within each of the classes. So we can change, change that here if we want to, but we don't have to. We can keep that as default. Kate? Yes, ma'am. There's a, someone in the chat is saying, oh, they found they, it. They okay. solved it. OK, great. Awesome. Thank you for, for stopping me. I appreciate that. OK. OK, so um, yeah. So again, we'll just go ahead and keep the defaults. Um, you, we can also change the number of classes where if we don't want five different colors associated with all of these different values, we can change the number of classes and recalculate those classes. Yes, it was changing the single symbol to graduated. I know, I miss it all the time. I even know what I'm looking for and I still miss it. It's just like it's too small. <laughs> they need to make it like, give it a little bit more space around it so that you can see it. Anyway, so I'm glad you were able to find it. Okay, so we can stop here or we can go ahead and change our color ramp. So the color ramp here is um, white to red, which you know we can keep that if we'd like it. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and change it to a different color ramp so that I can see the white tends to blend in with the background of the project. So I'm gonna go ahead and change it uh, to the yellow to red. You can also create your own color ramp if you want. That's totally up to you. So I'm happy with these settings. So I'm going to go ahead and click Apply. And then I now have a map that shows me the different categories, so the different areas where the average value uh, lands in these different classes. So you might notice here that we have some empty holes here where we have some white space. Um, so the reason for that is because we do have some null values in our data for the income and the property values, I believe. So, and I can just open up the attribute table really quickly to show you that. So here, if you scroll over property value and income, you will have some null values. And in that nifty little QGIS steps uh, uh, Word document that I mentioned earlier. You, you might notice that there is an appendix here that kind of describes why that is. Um, so there's a few different reasons for why that is the case. Um, it may be that there's no responses for that in, in that particular area. Uh, sampling variability can lead to null values, confidentiality and data suppression. So there's a lot of different reasons for why these null values could be appearing. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind that those affect the income and property values. So let's say we don't wanna use income as our, um, the, the way that we're representing our 
map, let's say we want to go ahead and change the symbology to something that has no null, null values. So here we can go back to, we still want to use graduated. We can change the value of our graduation classes. Um, so we can change it to any of these that we like. Um, you can do any of, of these on your own. Um, I'm going to go ahead and change percent Hispanic. And so before we click apply, we do need to reclassify our data. So be sure that you click this. Otherwise, if you do that, um, QGIS won't, won't know what to do with these classes because they don't make sense with these, these values. So here we want to go ahead and reclassify. And so now the values will recalculate based on the variable of the percent Hispanic population. So we'll click apply. And here we have a much nicer, prettier full map that shows um, the, the darker red is the higher percentage of Hispanic population. So I can scroll, uh, zoom in just using my, my roller wheel on my mouse. I can sc scroll into the Houston area and I can see the east side is much more predominantly occupied by Hispanic um, individuals, whereas west side is not as much. Um, so you can play around with this, look around in your particular communities and see you know, those different characteristics. OK, so we can go ahead and save our project here. Any questions so far? Everything making sense, going well? Okay, hearing none, we can go ahead and go into our first quiz. Um, so again, if you're just observing, this can just be a five minute break, um, but using the map project that you've created so far, go ahead and play around with it and see if you can create a map showing the percentage votes for Trump in 2020. Um, you can also play around and try different variables if you'd like. Um, but We'll go ahead, oops, I meant to start slideshow. We'll go ahead and take five minutes. So it's 3.39 right now. So um, we're doing really well on time. So um, go ahead and take uh, five minutes. So we'll come back together as a group at 3.45. Um, and please feel free to drop questions in chat um, as you have them. But when we come back, we will show you how, how this is done.
All right, that's a pretty quick five minutes. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm going to uh, take over the uh, webinar from this point. And uh, because we're doing so great on time, and I thought it could even be a refresher, I'm going to go ahead and catch up to where everybody is, and then we will be able to explore on my screen exactly uh, what the uh, what the votes look like uh, percent Trump in 2020. So I've opened the data source manager, and I'm going to double click on the shape file so that it appears. I'm going to bring in the ACS data, and I'm going to bring in the presidential election data. So as I'm double clicking, they're appearing on the layer list here. Then I'm going to double click, which is the same as right click properties. I just double click on everything in the software. Uh, and I'm going to go to the join tab, and I'm going to add both of these, just like uh, you all did with Kate earlier. GOID to GOID, and I'm going to remove that prefix. And then I'm going to also join the presidential election data and remove the prefix. And now that they're both joined, I can once again double click on Texas block groups, but this time go to the symbology and change it from single symbol to graduated, change the value to uh, what should be the bottom one, the P underscore Trump. And uh, when you're joining tables to shapefiles, uh, you can only use letters, numbers, and underscores in the tables. And so that's why things like percent signs uh, are forbidden, no spaces. So I typically use a P underscore to represent percent. I'm going to click the classify. I'm going to change the color ramp to the same one that Kate used. I think that was a really good one, the yellow, orange, red. And I'm going to click OK, and we should. Did I not click OK? Oh. Oh, please. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Good, good. The webinar gods are with me. All right. So this is, uh, it looks quite red. Uh, we can see what the color breaks down. Uh, but of course, if we were to zoom into any of the city centers like Houston, we can see, or we can zoom in to Austin, San Antonio, up to the Metroplex. Even, even little Waco here, uh, all have our a um, uh, little bit less red. And of course, along the border, uh, not as red as the rest of the state. So hopefully that was um, uh, uh, fun uh, to be able to take all of this data that we prepared in the shape file and uh, merge them together and to start to play with colors. Uh, but we're not stopping there, of course. We want to now, we're going to geocode a location or an address, it's up to you, uh, what you want to, uh, where you want to place your point, and then we'll draw those buffers uh, at five miles, 10 miles, and 15 miles, and calculate some summary statistics with all of the data that we joined into the shapefile. If like me, if your map is off to the side or you're zoomed in somewhere and you just want to get back to the starting place, there's a button right here. It mouses over where it says zoom full. It's a magnifying glass with arrows in three locations. If you click that, it will just take you out so that all of your content is centered right on the screen. And so uh, we need one of those plugins. Uh, if you remember at the beginning when Kate was walking through the intro, uh, there is our uh, over a thousand open source free plugins that are available for QGIS. In order for us to geocode an address or to type in an address or the name of a university or a zip code um, and plot that point, we need a particular plugin. The plugin that we're going to use is called Geocoding. Uh, so on your toolbar here, you want to click plugins. And then we want to go to the manage and install plugins. And it's fetching from the repository. And it's going to take you to where you were last. It may take you to all. It may take you to installed. Um, may take you to not installed. But we're going to go to all. And you can sort of just scroll down and see this is a really nice long list. And any item that you select, you'll get the whatever documentation was provided by the author of that plugin on the right. 
Uh, thankfully, there is a search, so we don't have to just scroll for what we want. So if the plugin is called geocoding, so if I type geocoding, and you'll see it has a capital G and also a capital C for geocoding. And it provides geocoding, which means you can type in your zip code, your city, you can type in the name of your university and it will plot the point. It also will handle reverse geocoding, meaning you can click somewhere on the map and it'll tell you what address would be at that location. Uh, so select geocoding and then on the bottom right, uh, install plugin. It should take just a moment. When your screen looks like this, it gives you, or for a moment, I had a plugin installed correctly above, but you will see down below my options now, instead of install plugins, show reinstall or uninstall. So it is successfully installed. Now I can click close. And the way that we access the functions from the geocoding plugin that we just installed is from this plugins menu. And you will now see where we didn't see before, underneath the Python console, there is now a geocoding um, top level category. And what we want to do is select geocoding. So when you select geocoding, you get this little geocoding pop up. And you can type in your full address. You can just type in a zip code. I can, for example, if I type Baylor University and you can hit enter like I'm doing right now or click okay, what it will do if there are multiple options, like for Baylor University, it's giving me these three choices, all of them in Waco, but different addresses. And so I can pick the first one and click okay and it would plot it. We can also, I just hit cancel there. We can also just type in a particular zip code and click okay and it'll plot that zip code or you can type in your full address just like you would into Google Maps and it should be able to find most locations. I'm gonna stick with the first one that I tried, Baylor University. That way there'll be no regrets of me typing in my home address that will be posted on publicly available YouTube. So I'm not gonna do my home address. Instead, I'm gonna use the university and click okay. And it plotted the point and it gives us, uh, for me, it gives me the, the full address of the one I selected from the three options for Baylor University. So the first thing we wanna do here is we want to make certain that we can see that label better, especially when the black is on top of all of this red, the black text, we cannot see it, we can't see it so well. Uh, so what we're going to do is you can see that a new layer was added called geocoding plugin results in our layer list. If we either right click and properties or double click, and what we want to do is we want to click on labels on the left here because we want to make certain that this label is a little bit more visible. It's only visible on my map when it leaves the state. So we're going to click labels. Then in the label uh, options here, we're going to select buffer. And all we're going to do is check this draw text buffer. And it's going to create like a little stroke effect around the text. And then I'm going to click OK. And now this is what the buffer did, gives us that nice little white stroke around the black text so that, so that it's more visible. The next thing we need to do is we need to make certain that we can access all, another tool that Kate was talking about in the intro PowerPoint. And uh, that is being able to view the processing toolbox, which is where all the good analysis and all the functions that people want to use GIS for are really in that processing toolbox within QGIS. I think when you do a fresh install, just I tried to do a fresh install here, uh, by default, the processing toolbox is not visible. If you see it on the right side of your screen, you're good. Uh, I don't have it. And you'll see that there is a processing a menu item on the top menu bar. And then the top item is toolbox. And that should put it in the default location all the way on the right side. And so the tool that we want to use first is called a multi ring buffer. You don't have to type all of that in the search here. 
just search for buffer. I don't have even have to hit enter. It just starts filtering uh, as you're typing. And the multi ring buffer with a constant distance is right there. And constant distance is going to be five miles. We're going to tell it we want three buffers at five miles constant distance for each of those buffers. So I'm going to double click. And it's going to open up this tool. So I want to make certain that it's clear for the geocoding, we had to install an external plugin. But for this tool, these are not external tools. These are tools that are packaged with QGIS. And so this is different from a plugin that would be from a third party. Uh, so the input layer, what we want to draw the buffers around, it should be the geocoding plug in results. The number of rings or the number of buffers is going to be three because we want three rings. And the distance for these rings is going to be five, but not meters, that would be quite small, five miles. Now, had we not projected the shapefile, if the shapefile was still unprojected in NAT83, still in decimal degrees, we would not have any of these options here. We would only be able to measure in distances of degrees and no one thinks in degrees. So that's part of the reason why we projected this file for us. Uh, so I'm gonna select miles five miles, I'm going to click run. Should happen very quickly. Uh, so I'm going to click close. You can sort of see the three buffers or rings that it generated. It also created a new layer for us in our layer list called multi ring buffer. Uh, there's a number of ways we can zoom to it. Of course, we can always use the zoom wheel to zoom in and out as we wish. But you can also right click on any layer in our layer list. And the very top item is zoom to layer, and it will zoom you in so that that particular layer is centered right in your screen. And there we are. Uh, so we can see that there is five, there is one polygon for five to 10 miles and one polygon for 10 to 15 miles. If we open the attribute table, just like we were doing earlier, if I right click multi ring buffer and just about in the middle, there's open attribute table. I can see here that this top row represents this polygon. So this top row represents uh, five miles from Baylor University. The second one represents from five to 10 miles. And this third polygon represents 10 to 15 miles. So what we want to do is we want to take all of that data that we've joined to the census block group shapes and we want to calculate the average values of all of the block groups that fit within the zero to five, five to 10 and 10 to 15 mile radii. So I'm holding control, that's the way, right? There's, the only way that you can unselect that from here is to hold control uh, and click it. It may, if you're on a Mac, it may be command and click instead of control, um, but that's how we would unselect. We can also, just so that we can get a better view, I double clicked on the multi ring and I'm gonna go to the symbology. And right now uh, I'm gonna leave it single symbol, but what I wanna do is to be able to see through it. I wanna be able to see the boundaries of the five mile, uh, but I don't wanna see that orange color. So I'm gonna select this simple fill here and where it says the fill color is this orange. I'm going to tell it, I'm just clicking on this drop down and telling it I want a transparent fill. So I want to see the boundaries, but I don't want to see the color in the middle. And then OK. So now we can make out, and it'll, right, if I turn that off, you can sort of see the five mile, the 10 mile, and the 15 mile. All right. So again, uh, in the processing toolbox, we want to use a second tool, and this is called the Join Attributes by Location Summary Tool. You don't have to type all that, just like with multi-ring buffer, just type join. And all of the tools that have something to do with joining data uh, appear. And the one that we want is the one that specifies summary in the parentheses, because that's the one that will built into one particular tool, not only do the spatial join where they have no, nothing in common except for where they intersect um, on the map, but it will also summarize all the values. 
So that's what we want to run is the join attributes by location summary. And so the uh, it wants to join features into the, the ring, and that's perfect. We want to take data from somewhere else and summarize it within our three buffers or our three rings. It's going to include them in the summary where they intersect. That means they are at least tangent or touch each other. We're going to be pulling that data from not itself, but the Texas block groups. And we will also, uh, we're not going to click run for a couple of, of, couple of uh, items we need to specify here. We first need to specify which fields or which columns that are joined to the shape file that we want to organize within our three buffers. And then we want to tell it that we want it to calculate the mean or the average statistic. So let's first click these three dots here to specify which fields to summarize. And we get this little pop-up uh, because we don't want it to summarize the GOID number, for example, right? What we do want are all of the joined columns are at the end of the table. So starting with property value, I'm going to select everything from property value all the way down to percent votes for Trump, which is the very last item. And then we want to click this OK, not run down here yet. That'll run the whole tool and we're not ready for that. Uh, you want to click this OK. And it specifies that we have 12 fields selected. Next, we need to tell it how to summarize it. Do we want a count? Do we want it to add them up? Do we want, right? How do we want them to summarize? So I'm going to click on this uh, three dot button. And you can see all of the options here, including count, min, max, range, sum, all of the items that I clicked from property value to income to percent uh, for each of the races to temperature data to um, uh, percent who voted for Biden or Trump, all of that data is best summarized by calculating the mean average. So I'm going to click mean. And then again, not run, but OK. And now we're ready, right? From the ring, connect to the block groups where they intersect these 12 columns. And for all 12 of those columns, summarize them by calculating the mean value. Then I'm going to click Run. Happens so fast. Uh, you can see already that a new layer was added. So I'm going to click Close here. The new layer that was added for me is called the joined layer, is what it's called by default. If we open the, if we open the attribute table of joined layer by right click, and just under the middle is open attribute table, we have the same three, right? This represents 5, 10, 15 miles. But now we have median property value or mean of median property values. So we can see that within zero to five miles, it's about 119,000 I'm rounding. From five to 10, it jumps up to 184,000. And then it jumps up even more. So the further you get from campus, uh, the, the higher the property values. I'm not going to go through each one of these this way, but you can see that all of the data is summarized now for us including the, uh, the closer to campus, we had 57.8% of the votes for uh, Biden in 2020. In the middle range, we had it's going down 36.6%. And in the final range, when it's highlighted, it all drops down to under a quarter of the votes were for Biden in 2020. And that was pretty quick. I don't know how many of you guys were following along, uh, but even if you're just watching, um, this video will be posted as well as, and I'm even following the same guide that Kate and I created, right? This is what I have on the side of my screen that I'm following our own instructions. And this, uh, these instructions will take you uh, all of the steps you need, including the part two that we just covered. Oh, control click. Um, takes you through everything from plugins, geocoding, 
how to geocode, type in everything here, the processing toolbox. So all of the steps are here, uh, available as the downloaded Word document or as the Google Doc in, the, in that folder where you downloaded the data. Are there any questions? Hopefully that was entertaining, if nothing else. Oh, I see a whole host of chat yeah. messages. So a couple questions um, with regard to QGIS. Uh, so can QGIS work with a list of places like music venues? I was thinking that if you had a CSV of those music venues that you can load that in, do you have, um, are there any alternative ways to add that kind of data into QGIS, Josh? Of course, if you have a spreadsheet of addresses, that can very easily be, ge be geocoded in a number of ways. I think for a list of places, like I was able to do Baylor University, I think it would have to be, uh, um, it couldn't be like just a mom and pop. It would have to be a music venue that had such a reputation that it would appear in uh, plugins like this one. Right, where you can just geocode and type in the name of a venue. But the optimal way, if you're doing research and you have tens, dozens, hundreds, thousands, or hundreds of thousands of music venues or any location that you want to geocode, you just need the address. If you have the address in um, an Excel file with any other attributes like the name and whatever other information that you want to analyze about the music venues. Um, there's a number of ways that they can be geocoded, all of them automatically. You don't have to type in one at a time like we did here. Uh, if you have an ArcGIS license on your campus, that's built in. You can geocode massive amounts of data. And there is a free, um, it's called GPS Visualizer. It's a website where you can register for a free Bing or a Google Map API, it's entirely free, and they will let you geocode up to 5,000 addresses per day, and it'll give you the latitude, longitude, and then you go right to QGIS or ArcGIS, and you've got it. So there's a number of ways that you can geocode. Awesome. Yeah, we have a couple more questions. So uh, do you know which geocoding service QGIS plugin is using? That's a good question. I don't know. I'm going to go to the about. That's not a lot of information. Uh, here we go. It's using nominatum. I don't know how to pronounce it, but I've seen I've seen this often for open source uh, geocoding and Google Web Services. So that's what, cool. that's what they are providing. But that GPS visualizer site that I was talking about, if you just Google for GPS visualizer and you go to geocode addresses and you can geocode multiple addresses, then you know specifically where it's coming from. And you can register for a free MapQuest, Bing Maps, or Google. I typically use Bing Maps. And using this service with a free Bing Maps API key, you can, oh, I think it even still has my key from the last time I was here. <laughs> you can eat, geocode up to 5,000 addresses per day, and then you know exactly what geocoding service you're using. Okay, and then one more question so far we have, um, instead of a circle buffer, can you get demographics for, say, congressional district or for user-defined areas like local neighborhoods? Yes. If you go uh, to the census tiger, and uh, you see that it's a census.gov uh, URL. So the tiger files are provided by the census to be to serve as the base map for the United States. So you'll find things like railway lines, roads, cities, places, congressional districts, zip codes, voter tabulation districts. So all will be here. And so if we go and we want to download for Texas, you can download 
uh, uh, you can see this is where I've been. You can download the congressional district boundaries, place boundaries. Yeah, so we would be able to get the, I don't know which one it is now, but oh, this one. So if we downloaded this, that would be the congressional district boundaries. We'd be able to add that as a layer on our map. Um, I don't know if I, I'm, I'm worried something will go wrong if I try and do it now, but <laughs> if we download that, unzip it, add it to QGIS, we would be able to select the congressional district that we're interested in, or just leave all of them in the state and do the same spatial join, except instead of right, instead of joining from block group data into the rings or the buffer layer, we would be able to do the same spatial join from the block groups into the congressional district or cities or places. Now, if it's something like a neighborhood that's like an unofficial neighborhood, you may then need to use the editing or drawing tools in QGIS to draw the boundary. Then you can, once it's drawn, then it's the same steps, but instead of joining the block group data to the rings, you join it to the neighborhood boundary that you manually drew. Awesome. Those are really great questions. Does anybody have any other questions for us? Right. Well, Josh, you want to go ahead and wrap this up? All right. Well, I thank you guys very much. I guess that's what wrapping up means, right? I thank you guys very much and enjoy your Wednesday afternoon. Thanks, guys, very much. Oh, yes.